Hello, everyone. We have with us Dr. Heather Browning, who is a lecturer at the University of Southampton. Her primary research interests are animal welfare, ethics, and consciousness. She's a PhD at ANU, where her thesis was on the measurement of animal welfare. Heather has also worked as a zookeeper and zoo animal welfare officer. Her work has been featured on Vox, and she's also done an interview with the BBC recently, among many more places. We're incredibly happy that you've taken out time to do this interview with us. So, Thanks. Yeah. To start us off, I have a few questions on um, animal ethics. So the first question that I have is, um, do you think we have a greater obligation to help animals in the wild or farmed animals? I think we've got a greater obligation to help animals that we've taken into our control. So I think that although I don't think we have no obligations to animals in the wild, I think that where we can yeah, we should be trying to improve their lives. I think in cases where we've created an animal, where we've brought them into existence for human use, then that creates this additional obligation to make sure that they have a good life, um, that you know, we've got this kind of relational duty, I guess, if you called um, that, you know, there's sort of these baseline duties perhaps to do any good that you can in the world, but additional duties when you're in this caring relationship with particular animals. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think that just because helping animals um, that are being farmed seems like an easier thing to do in terms of just the knowledge that we have um, compared to like wild animal welfare, which we're more uncertain about. Um, you've also published an article on how um, we often think that wild animals live really, really bad lives and how that's just not necessarily true, um, which I found very interesting. Um, but my question is about... Um, how a lot of wild animals are mainly insects and smaller animals like frogs. Do you think that their lives could be net negative? Because even though we might be unsure about, um, you know, or we probably are sure that like antelopes and deers live net positive lives, maybe like smaller animals that are predated upon more um, and just don't have access to the experiences that some of the larger animals have. Do you think that they could potentially live net negative lives? I think there's certainly going to be some members of those species that live net negative lives. So, I mean, one of the questions is how we weigh up against, you know, the, the individuals that do die, say, very, very young um, without much opportunity for positive experience versus those individuals who survive and go on. So, you know, if you take a frog, yeah, you know, a lot of frogs won't ever make it past the tadpole stage and perhaps their tadpole life is not as great. But those that do make it might then have access to quite a large range of experiences and pleasures over quite a longer time period. So when you've got these sort of small animals that at the larval stage perhaps will die quickly, there's a question then about how you weigh this up versus the number of animals that have net negative lives versus the number of animals that have positive ones and whether they can compensate for each other in some way. But I will also say as well that I think some people do take, you know, these um, young animals to have very bad lives. They think, well, they die very quickly and then their lives will just be full of suffering. I think even in that case, it's not going to be true, you know, even... A tadpole, for instance, is going to have some pleasures available to it. It's going to eat. It's going to have a warm, you know, environment that it's in that it enjoys the thermal comfort of. So I think, yeah, yes, it's true that it will be suffering if it's unable to find food and when it's being predated. This isn't going to be everything that makes up its life. It's still got access to some of the same pleasures. Yeah, and one thing that I'm um, interested in is how do we kind of determine whether um, a life is worth living for an animal? Um, by that, I mean, let's say that that animal like experiences more negative things in its life and has like one or two positive experiences. Do you think that they're enough to outweigh like the fact that an animal might have like a lot of negative experiences? I think it's going to depend on the nature of the specific positive and negative experiences. And so for some animals, you know, some of the positive things they have access to might be very rewarding or fulfilling. So you might think that you get, you know, a large degree out of enjoyment, out of, for instance, exercising agency in the environment. So this is something that people haven't paid a lot of attention to in animal welfare. They're doing so increasingly now. But the idea is that animals seem to enjoy having control over their environment and making decisions about what to do and where to go. And that's something that's available for lots of animals and might be quite rewarding. That might be quite a highly positively valenced experience and some negatively valenced experiences might be sort of less negative than you'd imagine. So I think these trade-offs are going to be very difficult. And one of the ways that we can look at how that they do compare is perhaps look at what the animals themselves would choose. You know, how much of a negative experience is it willing to undergo to get some positive experience? And then you can get a sense of how it trades those things off 
and then perhaps what the balance is going to be like. Yeah, and also evolutionarily, animals are driven uh, to for survival, right? Do you think that that might also mean that they live like somewhat net positive lives? Because even in cases where, let's say, um, they're being predated upon and they're being attacked by another animal, maybe like adrenaline could be high and they don't really feel that pain in that instance. Or maybe when they're like starving, um, they don't feel too much pain because that would like mean that they are li are likely not to survive. So maybe evolutionarily they are able to adjust to that and maybe like find a way to find food. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think really strong negative experiences are detrimental to causing action and they're also detrimental to the body. So like long-term stresses, for instance, are really bad for the immune system, make you much more susceptible to diseases, these kinds of things. And so I think a lot of the time animals find ways to adapt to these. If there are long-term stressful experiences, they're not going to find them as stressful as they perhaps would have if that was just happening once off. Like you said, there's things like adrenaline release because feeling a lot of pain um, can get in the way during a very large injury. If you're trying to escape from a predator, for instance, and that pain might come later, but then those are the animals that survive and are able to go on and have more positive experiences. So this balance between what counts as positive and negative and also you know, just how negative the suffering is, I think is something that can be difficult to tell from the outside. And this is one of the reasons I think we need more research to go out there and sort of, you know, look more closely at the animals and get markers of the positive and negative experiences, things like, you know, changes in their blood chemistry and get a better sense of how much they actually are suffering when they experience these things. Yeah. Now I want to talk about um, something else, uh, but it's interesting. Uh, it's essentially the ethics of killing carnivorous animals uh, in the <laughs> distant long-term future. Um, it sounds like a crazy idea because obviously it could cause like ecological imbalance. Um, but if we could like re-engineer the wild, uh, do you think that maybe there is uh, some ethical considerations that are worthy of looking into? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, yeah, the biggest thing against this is just I can't see the feasibility of it possibly ever, you know, given that the way that ecosystems work and the way that you need to keep animals in check, it seems very, very difficult to imagine you know, with no predators at all that you're going to have things be good. But if you could somehow manage an ecosystem of that way and, you know, re-engineer, like we said, re-engineer carnivores such that they are only eight plants instead, then I think that would be a net benefit. You know, there is, you know, this large source of suffering in the wild that is predation, that is caused by predation. And, you know, if you stop predators who currently exist from finding prey, obviously that causes suffering in those predators. But if you re-engineer them to not have that desire, to not, you know, no longer get a benefit out of killing prey, then I think, yes. Yeah. So I think all the questions around here, for me at least, are just feasibility questions. So I think, you know, ethically, it probably would be in theory a good thing to do. I think just practically, it probably wouldn't work because ecosystems are so complex and there's so many indirect effects that we need to take into account. Yeah. And what do you think about the argument that a lot of antinatalists make about animal welfare, which is that if humans don't exist, animals would be better off? I think that one's a really tricky one. I mean, I think in some senses we could say probably yes, um, you know, the non-existence of industrial farming, for instance, would certainly be a net good. What we might think is that humans have at least the potential to make animals better off in the long run. So that if we think there are sources of suffering, say in the wild, um, that we could actually intervene on at some point in the future and make animals better off, you know, supplement their food in times of drought, supplement their water, help them with these sorts of things. Then humans have the potential to make a net positive in a way that other animals can't do because they can't do these interventions on behalf of one another. So I think, yeah, being antinatalist, if you think that humans can't change and do those things, but perhaps if you think that we have the capacity to do better in the future, then that gives us a reason to think that we could make a positive change. Yeah. And another idea I had is if, let's say, humans do go extinct, um, what if like another species of animal um, is able to like evolve and, you know, is able to come to the top of the food chain and also able to do some of the harmful things that humans have done? Um, maybe that could potentially be like something that we wouldn't want. Um, and maybe humans, uh, we can trust that their moral circles expand with time and that maybe even with industrial farming, we see that like phasing out. And also, as you pointed out, like finding out ways to help wild animals. Um, my next question is about 
your perspective on like vegetarianism, which is if I'm a vegetarian and I buy dairy, that means that producers are incentivized to grow cattle. Um, if I'm a vegan, I'm not creating demand for dairy uh, in that I'm not supporting uh, the existence of, you know, having cows being reared into existence, essentially. Now, if we assume that like cattle do not suffer ne negative lives on farms, um, is being a vegan a bad thing? Um, like I think I think you pointed out something about this in one of your papers about like non-existence not being something that is bad. Um, but I wanted to know your perspective on this. Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot of people have a different view than I do on this. So a lot of people think that there's something there's something good about creating happy animals that you know having more animals rather than less if they've got good lives is a good thing and perhaps we even have a duty to make sure that comes about. I think I'm neutral towards that. I think that it's permissible to create a happy animal, but it's not something that we have a duty to do and perhaps it's not a good thing in other ways. So I think just the fact that we have cattle that have happy lives, if it were the case, you know, I think that's contentious about whether dairy cattle and, you know, farm cattle do have happy lives, but say that they do. Um, I think that doesn't give us a duty to go on and eat these things to make sure they be created. What it perhaps means is that it's not impermissible to use those products in those cases. But for me, I mean, the main argument for the dairy issue is obviously because of the young male cows being taken and killed quite young. And so it's quite possible that their lives are actually net negative lives. And so I think dealing with that problem, if you could have a dairy industry that was able to deal either by not creating male calves or by giving them good lives, then you'd probably see something that was much more ethically sustainable. Yeah. And at least in India, um, the dairy uh, industry is very linked to the beef industry. So cattle are raised for dairy and then used for beef later. And so if demand decreases for like dairy, then potentially we could also see that like affecting uh, the number of cattle that are killed. So um, maybe in the long term, if we're able to like find a way to make it such that farm animals live like net positive lives um, through like free range farming, uh, or maybe just having like cattle not you know, forcefully separated, um, things like that, maybe we could see some change. Um, but yeah, uh, my next question is, um, what do you say to people who say that we should eat more um, beef and less chicken for animal welfare? Um, so their claim is eating larger animals is much better because it's only one animal that's experiencing uh, the suffering as opposed to like 20 animals have to make up for the same meat that that one animal would give. Like, is it difficult to kind of make these um trade-offs like we don't know if like let's say the one big animal we're talking about has like a greater experience of pain than like the individual experiences of pain that the animals have so like how do we reconcile that yeah so I think this is one of the biggest questions that you know, myself and other people in this space are working on at the moment is just how do we make these comparisons between the welfare of different animals so that we can answer questions like these because you know, what we t typically talk about is something like a welfare capacity. An animal has some sort of you know range of experiences where it's most pleasurable and it's most suffering. Will have some sort of numbers that you could attach to them, say, and some other animal might have you know higher and lower numbers and a higher range of experiences that can have. And then you might think, well, look, the welfare of an animal that has this wider range of experiences is in some sense more valuable than the animal that can have the lower range of experiences. And so that makes it difficult when you're comparing the numbers. I mean. It's very difficult right now to know how we calculate what these ranges are for the different animals. But I think even for most of the plausible ways of setting those numbers, we're just going to see that the, the number of animals used is still going to become the major concern. So the differences between different animals on these welfare ranges is unlikely to be enough to outweigh the, the number of animals used. So the difference between chickens and cows compared to how many cows to one chicken, you know, how many fish all that sort of thing. I think the, the numbers are going to end up being the more important consideration there. But the second thing is also the ethical issues around um, climate. So, you know, this is probably something that come across before, but obviously, you know, beef is one of the biggest contributors to climate change and chickens much less so. So you've got this kind of trade-off here between having the product that perhaps is less wealthy impact, but the one that has higher climate impact. And for that reason, you know, I would say it's probably just the most ethical choice to have neither and go for plant-based products, which do better on both um, accounts. But certainly it is something that needs to be taken into account when people are thinking about which foods should they focus on and if they want to give up selectively, which ones they should choose. Yeah, and that's also why I'm kind of concerned about insect farming, um, which is that it would probably involve like many, many insects. And that could be like 
a lot of experiences of pain. And so it'd be really um, nice to know like the answer to this question. Um, and hopefully uh, we don't ha we don't see like insect suffering um, happen uh, in the future. Um, now I wanted to talk about sentience. Uh, so um, I've been struggling. Uh, could you like define what sentience is? Yeah, I mean, sentience is difficult because in a way we define it just by referring to things that we already know. And so it's more like, you know, we point to something and we say, well, sentience is that thing. So we talk about it as being the capacity to feel is sort of a definition that's most commonly used now, I think, by people in this area. And that just means, you know, when you when you think about your own experiences, you think, well, look, if I feel hungry or I hear music or something, there's something in common with all those experiences in that I feel them. I have a conscious experience that's attached to them. And being sentient then is just the capacity to have that conscious experience, to have a feeling from a first person point of view that, you know, you're a subject in a way that say a rock or a chair, there's nothing that it's like for them to experience the world, but a sentient animal, there is something that it's like, there's something like a light on inside. Yeah. And is um, sentience the same as just saying that an animal experiences pain or is it just, is it more than that? Is it also like the animal has feelings and emotions uh, that mean that it has intelligence that's comparable to humans and that's the reason we should care for them? So typically we would say sentience is a much more basic thing. So, I mean, not just the capacity to experience pain, but the capacity to experience basic feelings that are like pain. So, you know, that could be pain. It could be sort of hunger, maybe basic experiences of fear, um, thermal discomforts, and some of the positive things as well, some of the, the basic pleasures. But this isn't thought of as something that's intellectually very complex. So humans have a range of emotions that have a very strong cognitive component. You know, we might feel envy, for instance, that requires us to think and reflect on things. And so certainly an animal doesn't need to have these higher level emotions in order to be thought of as sentient. Really what we just care about is that it can suffer in some way, even if that's in a very sort of basic sense. Yeah. And um, are you confident that there will be some way to measure the welfare of animals? So for humans, like we could go by the per capita GDP or the HDI index. Um, but do you think there could be something like that for animals? Um, perhaps like heart rate, neural count, or like the willingness to overcome like a negative experience? Yeah. So I think there's a wide range of different things that we're currently using to measure the welfare of animals. And you know, you've named a couple of them. There's different physiological measures. So like you said, maybe heart rate changes in some of the blood hormones, for instance, seems to be able to indicate that. And also behavioral measures. So animals that have a higher welfare state will behave more optimistically. So we can actually test an animal about whether it's feeling optimistic or pessimistic by giving it sort of an ambiguous signal that they don't know if it signals something good or bad. And if it treats it in the good way, like it optimistically, that means its welfare is higher. If it treats it in the negative way, it means its welfare is lower. And so we can look at these different ways an animal behaves and get some sense of how good or bad its welfare is as well. Yeah. And how do we know what metric is more important than the other when looking at sentience? So if we're looking at like whether they have uh, nociceptors um, or if they respond to mo motivational trade-offs, like how do we know how to like weigh between them? This is a really difficult question. I don't think we have a good sense yet of exactly how to do that. So, I mean, the the criteria for sentience that we used you know, fairly recently when we were looking at decapods and cephalopods, we came up with a set of criteria. You know, internally, we felt like, well, look, they're not all just equally as important to one another, but to explicitly set weightings at this stage is really difficult to do. What I would say is I would tend to take the behavioral criteria as more important. And this comes more out of thinking about the evolutionary function of sentience. So we think, well, animals evolved to be sentient because it helps them in their environment. It helps them make certain kinds of decisions. It helps them create certain sorts of actions. And therefore, if we see an animal that's capable of doing those things, then that I think counts as stronger evidence that it's sentient than if it perhaps has just some you know, underlying neural biology. So we might think that having you know, nociceptors or having integrative brain regions would be necessary preconditions, but they're not enough to establish sentience unless we see these behavioral things as well. Yeah, and um, I wanted to know your perspective on like how AI could help with this. So um, I've done an interview with um, someone who is uh, researching like how 
AI could actually be really bad for uh, non-human animals because it could accelerate factory farming by making it more efficient. And one of the things that I thought about was that maybe AI could help uh, in wild animal welfare interventions. Um, do you think that maybe AI could like help us communicate with animals, like pick up on vocalize on their vocalizations and see what their heart rate might mean? Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, AI is really just as good or bad as the people who are using it. And so, you know, whether it can help or whether it harms is going to depend a lot on how it's being used. But I think there is this potential for it to be used. And so wild animals is a really good example because, you know, that's somewhere where we don't really have the capacity, we don't have the manpower to get out there and sample a very large number of animals and to, you know, bring together a lot of data. And if we're able to identify some indicators that are meaningful indicators of welfare that can be sampled from the environment, and then we can use computer programs to find those, to identify when they occur, and to sort of bring together and interpret them, then that might mean that you know, we're able to get a lot more data than a person going out with sort of you know, their own notebook would be able to do. And answering questions you know, like, what is what life like for very large range and very diverse species of wild animals? then having this sort of extra computing power might make those questions answered in a lot more quickly. Yeah, and why is there um, a pressing need for more research on the sentience of animals? Is it to see if uh, we know of a specific intervention in the wild does more good than harm? Like we don't know if banning plastic in the ocean does good or harm because maybe sea turtles suffer more from being killed by a predator than by like choking on plastic. And maybe we might get an idea about that. Or is it just also to like show to people that crustaceans are also sentient and then get like legislation passed to protect them under like existing animal cruelty laws? I think it's more the second thing. I think, you know, when we think about our moral circle being, you know, those sets of creatures that we think matter morally and sentience is very, very commonly used now as a criteria for that. And we think, well, okay, by establishing which animals are sentient and by getting a sense of what they're like, we can make sure that they're being protected so that we're not inflicting suffering on them so that, you know, at least we're not doing things that make their lives worse. And also we can get a sense of what their interests are. So we know, you know, if we are going to use decapod crustaceans, what, what is good or bad for them? You know, that gets us into questions about, you know, how do you transport them? How do you slaughter them? If you're going to use them, all these sorts of things, but that requires us to know all of these. And so I think the other sorts of questions you're talking about, these big, more general wild animal questions, whilst people are looking at those, I think they play less of a role. Yeah. And do you think there's a bias um, that humans have in that they think that other mammals are more sentient than, let's say, like crustaceans, octopus uh, and fish? Yeah, absolutely. I think when you see the way that humans rank sentience, it's pretty much just like a relatedness ladder in a way of like, you know, how close is this animal to us in evolutionary time? And so, you know, primates tend to go higher than other mammals, the birds. There are some exceptions. So I think there's also, you know, animals that are related to us, but there are also animals that are like us in some sense. So people rate quite highly, perhaps dolphins, for instance, because they're intelligent and they're social and elephants, the same sort of thing. You know, people, I guess, see something of themselves, of the things that we value in humanness in those animals. But, you know, it could turn out just as well that a cow is just as capable of suffering just because it's not as intelligent or it doesn't have the same sort of complex social life. So I think, yeah, we've very much got this anthropocentric bias of coming from our own perspective to think about sentience. Yeah, and um, I um, read that you also did some work on um, uh, crustacean sentience, and that led to, like, an amendment uh, to a bill in the UK, which is really cool. Um, how is the public reaction to that like? Um, someone told me that after this um, amendment was made, a lot of people's opinions changed about crustacean sentience and that they agreed that it was actually something that was there. And that's like a, an example of how the law can signal people into like believing something. Yeah, I was really surprised, actually. So I thought, so our report, you know, we were looking at both cephalods, cephalopods, so octopuses, and also the, the crustaceans. And I thought people would be pretty accepting of our ideas that, you know, octopuses were sentient because there's been, you know, my octopus teacher on Netflix and all of this. Octopuses are popular and people think they're cool. But decapods, the crustaceans, I think people just don't think that much about them. And so I assumed that we might have some pushback when these results came out that people would say, oh, it's crazy to think that lobsters have feelings. And it was just quite overwhelming how supportive people were in general that, you know, People were just like, okay, yep, that makes sense. Um, now what do we do about it? And we've had people asking a lot of questions, you know, should you be boiling them alive? Which the answer is 
no, that is obviously really, really painful for a sentient animal. But yeah, I think people have come on board with this a lot. And maybe there's something about crustaceans that they're the right kind of medium size and that they move at the right kind of speed compared to, say, insects, that people are much more willing to accept their sentience. But I think it was a really positive sign that they did. Yeah. And what, according to you, um, is the biggest challenge in measuring um, animal sentience? I think the biggest challenge at the moment is just not knowing that much about the mechanisms by which sentience is produced in the brain. So, you know, we've got this sort of neuroscience of consciousness that's really just beginning and, you know, getting some information, but we've still got just so much left to learn, I think you know, 50 years from now, we'll look back at what we know now, and it's just going to seem like this tiny speck. And so trying to decide about which animals are conscious can be really, really difficult when you just don't know, you know, what is it even in a human brain that makes us conscious. And so until we get these kinds of answers and we get, you know, the idea of the mechanisms that create conscious sensation versus, say, unconscious processing of different kinds, I think it's going to be much more difficult. And hopefully once we get a better sense of these things, that will make those questions a lot easier to answer. Yeah, and what skills do people need to work in the space of uh, measuring subjective animal welfare? Um, Depends on what sort of questions they want. I mean, certainly I'm a philosopher, so I take in these sort of theoretical, conceptual and methodological skills. I'm more interested in mapping out the space of what are the background assumptions we need in order to do this well? What are the concepts that we're using? But I think you know, most of the valuable work's being done by biologists. So, you know, we get a lot of welfare scientists, um, animal sentience researchers who are getting out there because that's where most of the knowledge gaps are. So there's this important theoretical work in uh, helping to identify the knowledge gaps and about, you know, identifying some of the best methods to overcome them. But what we really need is just a lot of people out there in the labs or in the wild studying these animals so we can get more information. Yeah, and just one question that's a bit unrelated to this. Um, it's essentially, what do you think is the long-term future um, for animals? Uh, so maybe we'll have like more AI, we'll have space colonization. How will animals fit into that world? Yeah, I mean, so I guess my hope, at least, is that animals will no longer be a food source for humans. I think that you know we'll shift away from that. I think we've got the technologies and we will continue to have the technologies to create, you know, very nutritious plant-based alternatives so my hope is that animals become almost like companions for us you know on companions on the earth like fellow creatures that you know we can interact with that we want to help but that we don't cause suffering to that you know as humans when we've got the technology to look after ourselves that we can then you know also use that technology to look after animals and improve their lives and so perhaps you know space colonization depending on how that's done if we want to do terraforming on other planets that will probably involve ecosystem services and perhaps bringing animals with us. But, you know, in all those times, I hope the idea is that we start really taking seriously their sentience and the idea that they are, you know, other subjects, other individuals, rather than thinking of them instrumentally. Yeah. um, So this is a lot about like um, animal ethics and also um, animal welfare um, and sentience. I wanted to ask a few questions about you. So what got you started in animal welfare? Yeah, so I started off, actually, I did a a degree in zoology when I first left school, and then I worked in zoos for a long time, so as you mentioned in the beginning. So I was interested in animal welfare there from the practical point of view, that when you're a zookeeper, your job is to look after your animals and you want to make sure they have good welfare. And so as I was doing that, I started thinking more and more about questions about how do we know whether these animals have good welfare? How do we know what is a good life? How do we know what they're thinking and feeling? And so that shifted me into the more academic sphere of trying to answer those questions from the point of view of philosophy. Yeah, and um, I uh, I was really interested in like um, uh, you know you your work in like a zoo and like how that might have um, been how that might have like made you care a lot about the animals that you were helping because we we're working with them directly and um and firsthand and this is also like a more general question but like what do you think ha- gets some people to like care more about animals than like others like is it something um like them like you mentioned um you know people care about octopuses because of the i think is it the octopus teacher uh, or something like that um I definitely would like say that I watch a lot of like nature documentaries and um, I also um, 
used to watch this show called The Wild Cats when I was growing up. And that like really made me interested in animals. But is it is it stuff that starts from like when you're a child or is it like people just being convinced um, later on to like care about animals? I think definitely the more people connect as a child, I think the easier it then becomes later on. But certainly people can come to it at any stage. And I talk to people who said never really thought about it. The big thing that really seems to influence people is having a connection of some kind with an animal. So whether that's in person, you know, having a pet or a zoo animal or a wild animal that they form some relationship with and get a sense of, you know, interacting that this is, you know, another being. Or even, like you said, watching the right kinds of nature documentaries or TV shows where the animal's presented in such a way that you see it as an individual, you see, you know, what that animal is. I think these kinds of moments are what lead people to think about animals and to care about them in a different kind of way because often otherwise they're just the background to people's lives and they don't really think about them. But when you're sort of faced with them as this real individual, it makes you start thinking about you know what matters to them and why they should matter ethically. Yeah. And um, what advice would you have for someone who's interested in philosophy um, or applied ethics and wants to work in animal welfare? I mean, part of my advice would just be like, definitely do it because we really need more people in this space. So um, I think, you know, getting a grounding in basic philosophy is really important. So you know, philosophy, the methods of philosophy, I guess, when we're talking about, you know, conceptual clarity and about, you know, unpacking background assumptions, thinking about the justifications for the claims, the way you argue for things are all really important to apply to any field. And so I think having a combination of these philosophical skills, but also a bit of the biological knowledge is the perfect sort of package for when you're thinking about animals. So when we're working with animals, you know, you do want to understand what they're like as creatures. So understanding a bit of evolutionary biology, understanding a bit of animal minds, is also really helpful then for getting a sense of not doing too much of an anthropocentric animal ethics. For instance, you want to think about an animal ethics from the point of view of the animals, not from the point of view of ourselves. And I think understanding the biology really helps that. Yeah. And um, do you have any thoughts on anything we haven't discussed yet or um, something you wish you were asked? Um, nothing that I can think of specifically now. Okay, thank you so much, um, Heather, for uh, your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. And um, I will say that like when I was um, reading up about sentience, it was something that was a bit tricky and complicated. Um, and then I'm like really happy that I was able to like get answers to some of these questions that I had. Um, and I think that it's really important um, to do work in this area, especially because um, we're learning so much about just like how bees are sentient, about how crustaceans are sentient. And that's really helped in getting policy change and um, will definitely expand people's moral circles. Uh, I really admire your work and um, you should definitely um, follow um, Heather's Twitter where um, she um, tweets regularly and um, yeah, has like really good content on animal welfare. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's been really nice to talk to you.